Well, look, it's great to be here this morning. And, um, you know, as, as Neil said, we're continuing our series on reaching out. If you've got a Bible with you, if you'd like to turn to Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. And we're going to have this on the screen as well behind us. So if you don't have a Bible, that's fine. Or you might want to flick to it on your phone. We've been doing a series over the last few weeks on reaching out and the rhythms of discipleship. Breathe in, breathe out. And today's one, um, you know, is really about, and it's very topical right now, right? So let's just be open to what the Lord has to say to us today through his word. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand And it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that we are in a place where we can hear your word. And we pray this morning, Lord, that you would speak to us. The Lord, as we are going through this trial in the world now, that you would speak to us and that you would use us. In Jesus' name, amen. So yeah, I mean, it would be remiss not to mention the current uh, news and the global pandemic, and I recognise this is a challenging period for all of us, not just for the UK, but as we see right around the world, it's a really challenging period. It's causing a huge amount of fear and uncertainty. Um, It's causing the sad, premature death of many people and a global impact that I think we don't yet realise and is impossible to fully predict. But at times like this, I think our faith can be really tested as well. You know, we can say, where, God, are you in all of this suffering? Where are you, Lord? We see so much uncertainty, so much hopelessness and fear in the world, and we can say, Lord, where are you? But there is a promise that Jesus made to his disciples right at the end of his ministry here on earth. And he makes that promise to us today as well. And it's this promise, these words, surely I am with you always. Surely I am with you always. So as we look at this topic of of reaching out this morning, we can be confident that God is with us and that he will give us strength to stand firm in our faith at this time. But I wonder what kind of response you have inside when you hear the term reaching out or the term evangelism or outreach, or witnessing. Maybe for you the term reaching out is one that you think, that's just not for me, I'm an introvert. Um, I'm quite happy to come to church, I'm quite happy to serve. But as far as reaching out goes, that's out of my reach. I kind of park that part of of the calling. I'm not going to really be too enthused by that. Or maybe reaching out and sharing your faith is an area where you feel that you've tried, you've given it a go, but if you're honest with yourself, you don't feel you're very good at it. Um, to be honest, you've tried and, and you've failed. You plucked up the courage finally to invite somebody along on a Sunday or at a carol concert. And at the end, they said, yeah, that was really nice. Uh, really nice. I'm, I'm uh, glad you have a faith. You know, it's great that you have a faith. And I actually respect you for your faith. In fact, I wish I could have a faith like yours. Um, but you've not really seen much fruit. And if you're honest with yourself, you, you've given it a go but you feel that it's one of those things that you're not great at and you've not seen a huge amount of fruit at in your own personal life. Or maybe Billy Graham is your hero, after Jesus, of course. But Billy Graham is your hero. I mean, everyone knows that you're a Christian at the school gate, in the workplace. People know that you have a faith and they know that you want them to have a faith as well. Maybe you're just naturally, you just have this gift of sharing with others and it just comes easily to you and it's just not a challenge at all. Uh, Many years ago, when Ellie and I, were, uh, my wife, were at Bible College um, uh, in our 20s, we went to Kingdom Faith Bible College down in Horsham, and we studied for a certificate in Christian ministry. It was a very practical course, and on the curriculum was Bible study, as you'd expect, Old and New Testament. Um, There was a prayer school that we would have. Uh, There was uh, learnings and teachings around the gifts of the Spirit, and we'd have the curriculum every week, and on Friday afternoon... The topic was outreach. 
And um, no one pulled a sickie, of course, because we were Bible college students. Not that anyone would do that anyway. But I'm sure that for some people, Friday afternoon made people feel pretty sick and unwell. Because it was the thought of going out into the streets of Horsham and Crawley in West Sussex and going up to people, strangers, and asking them for a bit of their time to share the good news of Jesus with them. Now that, was, for a lot of people, was like way out there. Really quite scary. And so what we tend to do is we would gather in the college first of all, we'd pray, and then we'd go out into the town, either the bandstand in Crawley or in the market town of Horsham in the, in the town square. We'd start off with singing a couple of songs with someone with a guitar, maybe a bit of drama, and then someone would give a, like a two or three minute message, and then we'd go out in pairs and we'd share with people, and we'd ask some questions, maybe a questionnaire, and ask them, you know, how often do you pray or do you pray? What's your thoughts on Jesus? And we'd then open up and have a conversation with people. And there was one time when I was, uh, and it was great. I mean, it was, it was at times scary, but it was, um, we, we, we saw some really great conversations. There was one time I was leading the outreach. And as the outreach leader, I was responsible for all that we were going to do in that afternoon. And um, of course, in the college, everyone's very enthusiastic and we're going to go and we're going to take Horsham. And uh, I had this wonderful idea of when we're singing a song, uh, why don't we all grab a flag as well, just to create more of a spectacle in the town of Horsham. So everyone grabbed their flags. So we went troopsing off into the town centre of Horsham. And we began singing our songs and we were waving our flags, some of us awkwardly, singing Mighty is Our God. And um, the bemused town of Horsham looking on what's going on. And I sent the message round very quickly as the... um, as the outreach leader, drop the flags, drop the flags, the flags too much. Because it was just all that excitement <laughs> and all that fun, but in reality, this was pretty scary stuff. And um, one th- a couple of things I learned there, that, that flag waving is, is very much a gift, um, <laughs> uh, only for a few, and, and can only be pulled off by a few. And the second thing I learned, in, uh, one of the key principles of leadership is, is know when to stop. And I certainly had to learn that at that point. It's just dropped that. But we had some great conversations. But wherever you are on the kind of spectrum of outreach, and however you respond when we hear the term, this morning I really want us just to be encouraged, um, to be inspired, I suppose, by what Jesus wants us to do. And the help that he gives us to do that as well. Um, Firstly, let's look at what we mean by reaching out. We hear the term reaching out, but what do we actually mean by that? We can look and learn a lot from the the life of Jesus. As we look in the Bible, in the Gospels, we read about the different facets of Jesus' life and his ministry. And at the moment, at Lent, we're remembering Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness. He was alone. He was solitary for 40 days. Jesus spent a lot of time alone, solitary. In Mark 1.35, we read that very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And later we read, after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Alone in prayer, solitary. And as we read on, we read that Jesus spent time with just him and his disciples, Just 12 disciples and Jesus, walking from town to town, in the boat together, in the upper room at the Last Supper, and of course in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus alone with his disciples, not reaching out, just with his disciples. And then finally, of course, we read of Jesus, many accounts, reaching out to the public, In the towns and the villages that he visited, he reached out, sharing the good news of the kingdom of God. Sometimes it was to specific individuals on a one-on-one basis. We read of many accounts of that. The woman at the well, Zacchaeus, the tax collector, the lame man that was lowered down. One-on-one ministry, Jesus specifically ministering to an individual. But he also reached out to crowds of people. In Luke 5, verse 1, on one occasion, Jesus was preaching to the crowds 
on the shore of Lake Galilee. There was a vast multitude of people pushing to get close to Jesus to hear the word of God. Jesus reaching out to a vast multitude of people. And of course, the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 6,000, what a sight. Just a throng of people there with the disciples and Jesus reaching out. And the same applies to us today. At times we can be alone, solitary, in prayer. Other times we can be with other believers. Not actually reaching out, but just being spending time with other believers. Small groups, or as we are today. But other times we have opportunities to reach out. To reach out to others, to our friends, to our family, or maybe to even larger groups of people. I think social media plays a potential part in that too. But by reaching out this morning, I mean actually any activity that seeks to share the love, the grace, and the good news of Jesus with others. Just say that again. Reaching out means any activity that seeks to share the love, the grace, and the good news of Jesus with others. So we have many ministries here at King's that are focused on reaching out. We have Little Stars, our parents and kids group that meet every week. We have King's Table, the ministry to help the homeless and the addicts in Wickham. We have the Alpha Course that runs here on Tuesday nights. Our carol concerts at Christmas, of course. Overseas, our work and support with the church in Nepal as they seek to reach out to the community in the Dolpa region. Uh, Jackie and Wes uh, in Africa, working for Wycliffe Bible Translators, reaching out to the community there. And more locally, Christians Against Poverty here in Wickham. And more recently, Azalea, to help women caught up in sexual exploitation. And many, many more other activities that we have here at King's, focused on reaching out to others. And just to say thank you to everybody that is involved in any of those, or those that I didn't mention, ministries of reaching out. It is a sacrifice. I spoke at the, um, the King's table a few weeks ago, and was just blown away by the work that the team there put in, just to reach out to these needy people. And there are so many more other examples of that going on here. And God sees that. And it is just wonderful to see his body working in that way. So praying for a friend or relative, even if they don't know that you're praying for them, is reaching out. Inviting a neighbour around for a coffee and just sitting and listening, that is reaching out. Or sharing your story with a work colleague after work, after, after a beer, that is reaching out. And we're all called to reach out. I think, actually, we can have a tendency to think that when we hear the term outreach or evangelism, we think of someone like Billy Graham or the great revivalist preachers, uh, John Wesley, Evan Roberts, and we think about um, evangelists as those that are responsible for reaching out. And then we read in Ephesians 4 that Christ gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And we can conclude, well, I'm, I'm not an evangelist, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a nurse or I'm a, 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 a school worker. Or I'm an account manager, but I'm definitely not an evangelist. I'm an introvert. Um, But yes, there is a specific ministry of an evangelist in the Bible. But we're all called to share the good news of Jesus with others. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus wasn't addressing evangelists here. He was addressing all of us. Every believer, we're all called to be salt and light in the world. So what does this mean then on a practical level? What does it mean to be salt and light? Again, I think we can often see reaching out and evangelism and outreach as being very, very direct and even at times confrontational. I mean, let's face it, telling someone that the Bible says that they're a sinner in need of God's forgiveness, um, speaking about judgment, speaking about heaven and hell, it's not a popular message. And whilst we can never dilute the truth of the gospel... And everyone's need to be forgiven, 
from sin. Everyone's need to be saved. Everyone's need to say sorry to Jesus. The Bible does give some really practical guidance on how we are to go about sharing with others. And this is really helpful guidance. Because I think it's a topic that we can feel quite daunted by and as if I don't know actually where to start. So let's look at a couple of scriptures on the how. 1 Peter 3.15. Great, you've got them up on the screen. Brilliant. 1 Peter 3.15. Always, I won't be reading the whole part, just a section of it. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Jude one twenty two. Be merciful to those who doubt. Colossians 4 verse 6. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And finally, Ephesians 5.16. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. These are all guidance teaching on how to go about reaching out. And in this, we hear words like gentleness and respect and mercy and grace and phrases like seasoned with salt and being prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have, making the most of every opportunity. So whilst we are to absolutely preach the good news and reach out and tell people the good news, there is a piece around how we do that as well. We do that in a way that is respectful to where others are coming from. It always really frustrates me when I see these placards of so-called Christians holding up these critical, judgmental, harsh placards which just, just look like anger and resentment and bitterness and hatred actually towards the world. That is not how Paul, that is not how Jesus called us to reach out to the lost. Gentleness, respect, showing mercy, Speaking the truth in love. And Jesus never called us to criticize people into the kingdom of heaven. It's all about showing mercy and love and and those opportunities when we have them to sprinkle the conversation with salt. And in practical terms, these passages are really encouraging us to show gentleness and respect towards a Muslim who reads the Quran every day and has done since he or she was a youngster. To show grace in a conversation with an atheist. To show mercy towards an agnostic. We're called to speak the truth in love. So to that first example, to a Muslim we may say, I respect that you have faith and that you believe Jesus was a prophet. I had a very similar conversation with someone, a taxi driver, not so long ago. I I respect you have faith, that you believe Jesus was a prophet. But one of the fundamental differences between your faith and mine is that as a Christian... I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died for us and rose again three days later so that we could have a right relationship with God, not through our own works, but through faith in him. And the good news is that he loves you. There's a way in which we can share that sees where people are coming from and actually meets them at that place. We read their scripture about the world needing Hope. Well, what a time for that. See, hope is about a positive future. And unfortunately, hopelessness is symptomatic of being in this world. It's exacerbated at the moment, but hopelessness is part of being in this world. The devil is at work in this world. And he comes to steal, to kill and destroy hope because we are made in the image of God. But God says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Christians are to be hopeful people. We are to be people filled with hope. We should be known for our hope. And as believers in Jesus, we have this eternal hope within us. This eternal hope of a positive future, of heaven. With no suffering, no tears, no sickness and no war. But we also carry the hope that Jesus has overcome the world and that he's with us and he's here with us on earth. 
that he's sent his spirit to help us with us on this journey through the unpredictable world in which we live. A world full of hopelessness, suffering and fear. And Jesus said of these times, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And Jesus says that to everyone. You will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He has overcome the world. It's good news. We believe in one who is higher, who is greater, and is above all the troubles of this world. He's seated on the throne in heaven. He's ruling, he's reigning, and he knows all things. He knows the end from the beginning, and he has defeated sin and sickness and death once and for all on the cross. And he fills our hearts with peace and with hope. And we know that the coronavirus is is a serious global pandemic. Many have died. Health services around the world are just seeing the beginnings of the pressure they're going to be under. And it's caused global financial markets to crash. We know all of this. We see it in the news and it can feel quite hopeless. And we don't quite know when the end of this will be. But in this world of fear and hopelessness, we carry within us a hope. We have this treasure, as we see in 2 Corinthians, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. You know, the biggest fear that the human race has is the fear of death. The fear of death. But Jesus has defeated death. That is the hope that we have. That he has overcome death and he's overcome the grave. That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that no one should perish but that we should all have eternal life. That is the hope that we have. That is the treasure that we have as, as in, in, in these jars of clay that we are. That he brings hope where there is fear. He brings peace where there is anxiety. He brings joy where there is sadness. He brings the promise of eternal life where there is the fear of death. So being salt and light means sharing the treasure, that hope that we have within us of eternal life. It means sharing that. Indeed, we are in a kind of, there's no light at the end of the tunnel at the moment. We are in a dark tunnel at the moment, but we can be lights in that tunnel for people. We can shine as lights in the tunnel. And there will be an end to this. This won't be the headline one day. Praise God, there will be an end to this. But until then, we shine as lights. There's practical ways in which we can do this. Back in autumn 2018, uh, we ran a teaching and small group program. uh, And it was called Bless. And there's some, uh, you can see the Bless list there on the wall. And some, um, I think the Bless booklets there as well. You can pick up those afterwards. It's a practical framework for reaching out to others. Um, and provides five steps for reaching out. It's not the only way, but it's a really, really helpful framework. Now, obviously, we don't have time to go over the whole BLESS series in two minutes, but just to recap, that the five principles of BLESS, B, begin with prayer. I've heard that wonderful phrase, talk to God about the person before you talk to the person about God. Uh, L is listen, ask people where they are at, listen to their views and experiences. We've got two ears, we've got one mouth, listen. Hear where they're coming from. Thirdly, eat together. Go out for a coffee, invite people around, go out for a meal, show hospitality. The S, the first S is serve, seek ways to serve others. C.S. Lewis once said, most of the time I think of myself as a noun, but I must eternally be an adjective. How can we serve others? And finally, share your story. We all have a story of how we came to believe. Your story is really powerful. So let's be ready to share our story. We're going to be have a, a moment after I've spoken for, for us to look at that again and to revisit that and those that haven't got a bless list to, to create one. I think of five people that you can reach out to. I know I was praying for somebody on my bless list a while ago and saw an amaz- amazing change in his life. He was in a very difficult place um, and came through that. Now, I believe that prayer makes a difference. 
I've not had a chance to go through the whole part with him, but no, no doubt, certainly praying for people. I was at a breakfast a few weeks ago I was with, with work, and we were meeting, um, meeting a new company, so there's two couple of complete strangers, and um, we, we would, went down for breakfast, and we sat, sat down, and, and the, one of the chaps said, so what are you giving up for Lent then? So didn't know I was, I was a Christian, just what, what are you giving up for Lent then? So after proudly telling him that I was giving up celery for Lent, I, I, I just say huge respect for anyone giving up chocolate for Lent. I, I, I applaud you. I just know if I tried, I'd think of chocolate every day during Lent. But huge respect. But, uh, <laughs> but I, after telling him that I was giving up celery and, and continuing the discussion, it's one of those split-second moments when I, I know I had an opportunity to share something of my story. This chap said, oh, I, I, you know, I'm not into that. I used to be a Roman Catholic. I, I was brought up, I'd kind of lost my faith and... When it was time to go to Mass, I used to go and line a field and look at... You know, I told a story about his own experience. And, and I knew I had that moment of opportunity. And I, and I thought of Bless at that point. And I thought, we're eating together. That's a good start. Um, I didn't have time to pray, but I certainly shared my story. And I had just five minutes there to share my story. And it, was, you know, it, was, it wasn't awkward. It wasn't difficult. I didn't then say, shall we bow our heads and I'll lead you in a prayer of... Because, you know, because I mean, unfortunately, sometimes I like to... Um, to sow the seed, see the seed grow, and harvest it at the same time within two minutes. But as, as we know, uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has, made, has, God has made, made it to grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes the things grow. So we are just planting seeds through telling our story. We're just planting seeds through speaking of the hope that we have. We're planting seeds and we, don't, we may never know the impact that that seed has had on that person's journey of faith. I may not speak to this chap again. I might do, I don't know. But that was just one moment of, of sharing. And I was inspired by Bless as, uh, as I thought of that moment. And um, this great term about seasoned with salt is that, is, isn't it awful when you're, you've got this wonderful meal in front of you and you turn over the salt cellar And the lid hasn't been put on properly, and the salt goes all over it. And you try to pick out the salt, but actually you know the meal is ruined. Because it's just got it's just too salty. And I you know, this phrase of being seasoned with salt, I remember once um uh Adrian Holloway talking about inviting all of his friends around. He moved into the air and he invited all of his friends around for a barbecue and um just to get to know them. And he said, I didn't then at the end, when everyone was eating their burgers, stand up on a table and tap the table and say, right, I'm just going to share the gospel with you all because I've got you all in my house. And um, this bun is, is like, the bottom of the bun is like you and the top of the bun is like God. And this burger is like your sin. And, um, and it's separating you from God. He, he didn't feel the need to, to, to oversort that meal. You know, it was just a case of getting people around. And we have did this with our neighbours. We had them round for mince pies and mulled wine a few years ago. And we've just had some really great conversations on the end of that. I think if I had said at the end of that first time, tap, 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 you might be wondering why I invited you all around today. You know, so season with salt. It's just this, don't over-salt the meal. Just season the conversation with salt. We're blessed to live in a country where we can share the gospel without fear of imprisonment without fear of persecution. I think the worst we'll have is people thinking that we're nutters or that we're over, overzealous or maybe a bit politically incorrect or maybe a bit naive. And I know for some, um, there might be some very serious family rejection as a result of having a faith in Jesus. I recognise that, and that is terrible. Um, but no one here will really end up in prison um, and seriously persecuted in this country um, for sharing our faith. Uh, Pastor Wang Yi is a 46-year-old former lawyer. He's an evangelical pastor in China, and he was listed as one of the 50 most influential public intellectuals of China by Southern People Weekly. He met with President George W. Bush at the White House in 2006 to discuss religious freedom in China and was awarded the prize for contribution to promoting religious freedom. And you'll see this video clip now, and he features about halfway through this, um, this video clip. In 2004, he started a church in his home through Bible study, similar to how King started. And it grown to 500, and it's the Early Rain Fellowship in China. Um, this is a news article 
in, on ITV News. In China, if you choose to worship God, you are accepting you will be watched by the police. The church and these growing congregations have been accused of undermining devotion to the Communist Party, with President Xi warning they could be a conduit for foreign infiltration. As the Sunday morning service got underway at the Early Rain Presbyterian Church, two uniformed officers arrived to check on the congregation. They focused on the overspill rooms, which are a reflection of how much this gathering in Chengdu has grown. More and more Chinese people are turning to Christianity, despite a government crackdown. New laws have been introduced which give the state greater control over religious meetings, their message and their members. Despite the risks, Pastor Wang Yi continues to use his sermons to condemn the regulations. We pray, God, please let us be prepared to face persecution when it happens. In the past year, a number of church leaders have been arrested, and Pastor Wang fears he could be next. I need to prepare my brothers and sisters for possible persecution. They might be arrested soon. This church might be closed. Someone might lose their job because of their belief. Some who work for the government might be investigated for their participation in the church. In January, officials in Shangxi province ordered the Golden Lampstad Church to be demolished. A building permit violation was used as justification for blowing it up. Hundreds of churches have been destroyed or closed and thousands of others have had their crosses forcefully removed. There is intentionally nothing marking out the entrance to the Early Rain Presbyterian Church. Its congregation meets on the 23rd floor of this high-rise in central Chengdu. Freedom of religion may be guaranteed in China's constitution, but it's one of thousands of house churches forced to hide from sight by a communist party that views Christianity as a threat. But still, every week more Christians are being baptized. We spoke to some of the newest members of the congregation, including Yang Yang, whose family object to the church. Chinese families are influenced mostly by traditional culture and object to Christian belief. So it's very difficult for me at home. They described finding a trust in God that they no longer have in the government. Okay. I do believe no matter how much they... That just gives a view of what's really going on. On December the um, 2nd, 2018, Chinese authorities arrested Pastor Wang Yili, um, along with his wife and more than 100 members of the Early Rain Church and shut down the church. And he's been detained for a year without trial. His wife was released on bail after six months. And at the end of last year, he was put on trial. And a court statement released in December 2019 stated that he's been jailed for proclaiming the gospel. Uh, also states that he's got a nine-year prison sentence and deprived of his political rights for three years and fined. That's the reality. That's the reality of what some people are facing, and that's not to heap any guilt on us at all. But we live in a country where we can share. We live in a country where we're free to share. Um, there's a statement from him that says... Those who lock me up will only one day be locked up by angels. And those who interrogate me will finally be questioned and judged by Christ. And when I think of this, the Lord fills me with a natural compassion and grief towards those who are attempting to and actively imprisoning me. And he says these words, Pray that the Lord would use me, that he would grant me patience and wisdom, that I may take the gospel to them. So, the church go on to say, let's pray for him. Let's pray for Pastor Wing and let's pray for all of those who are being held in this way. But we do live in a nation where we are free to speak the good news of Jesus. We live in a nation where we are free to tell people that Jesus is the hope, that Jesus is the way, that Jesus is the truth, that Jesus is the life, and that Jesus is with us. Just a couple of final points before I wrap up. Um, not everyone will respond positively. 
some will reject the gospel. The Bible's very clear about that. Um, a friend of mine who's a staunch atheist, we've had many, many conversations, but I can tell you it's going to take a miracle for him to believe. And we've had many conversations, and it will take a miracle. Um, but his lack of belief in God does not mean that God does not exist. Amen? But there will be people who do not believe. And I've also already mentioned, just to reiterate, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Bless is a marathon, not a sprint. For some, you might have seen some real responses on your bless list and encouragements. But for others, you might have seen absolutely no change whatsoever. But don't think that's hopeless. Keep on going. Stand on that promise in 1 Peter 2.9, that the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. It all takes time. For some, it might be like the criminal crucified with Jesus, who put his faith in him right at the end. And just to finish, Christ's love compels us. 2 Corinthians 5.14 Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore we all died. We're not compelled to reach out by guilt or because of bless or anything else. It's the love of Christ that compels us to reach out, to be salt and light in the world. So whatever response you have to the term reaching out, whether it's one of absolute fear and trepidation or one of joy and excitement, Let's all be ready to give a reason for the hope that we have. Let's all be ready to be salt and light in the world. Let's pray for opportunities to share the good news of Jesus. Let's pray for boldness to take those opportunities. And let's pray that we'll always be compelled with the love of God. Amen? Amen.